Okay, so I have some practice. We've been talking about contemplative practices, and I want us to take uh, an opportunity to practice a, a spiritual reading of scripture this morning. And I've chosen to use the one of the readings from today. Why not? Um, random of this. Of the random randomness of it is part of the point. It's not like the planet. It's just, so I said, okay, let's do the parable. So um, Matthew 21, today in our readings, we read Matthew 21, 33 through 46. And what I want us to do, I'm not going to reread it. I think we're familiar with it. It tells us, um, and you may look over it as, as we think about it. But historically, the church has talked about, I mean, from, from the time of the desert fathers and mothers, they talked about there's four senses to reading scripture. The first sense is its literal meaning. They call that the human sense. You can get that sense of the reading without having the spirit of God. It's not a spiritual reading. It's the literal, factual, historical reading of the text. Not, and it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. There's a place for it, but it's not a spiritual reading of the text. Anyone could read the text and get that meaning from it. Then there are three spiritual readings of the text. In Latin, they're meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. So they're, they're like meditation, prayer, contemplation. And 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 I'm I, you know, I don't never study Latin, so those pronunciations may not be, you know, stacked whatever. So but there's those three senses, and they correspond to the Son, the Spirit, and the Father in that order. So what I want us to do today is I want us to try and practice this just as an example of how to read scripture beyond just the human sense. Okay, but let's start with the human sense. So, so here we are in Matthew 21, Jesus tells this parable about the vineyard and the owner, you know, lends, you know, leases it away to some workers, and then he sends his servants to collect what is due and the servants get mistreated killed, whatever. Finally, he says, I'll send my son. And my sure they respect my son. They they he sends the son, they kill the son, so they say, Well, he's the heir. Now we now it'll be ours. You know, we've we've effectively stolen this. And and then you know, Jesus gets done with that parable, he asks the, the people the question. So what what do you think this owner's going to do? Well, he's you know, he's gonna be very angry. He's gonna you know, take it from them and give it to someone else. You'll lease out his vineyard to someone who will actually give him what is due him. You know, that, that's their obvious response. And then Jesus applies it, basically. He says, okay, so, so that's what's going to happen to Israel. And at the end, it says, you know, the scribes and Pharisees perceive that he's talking about that. <laughs> Very astute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so on the literal level, the literal level, Jesus is telling a parable that has to do with Israel's unfaithfulness, particularly about the leadership. Not necessarily about all the commoners, but particularly about who was in control and what they did. Right? And so the servants that were sent were the prophets, you know, sent by God to speak to Israel. At this point, is they never would listen to them. They wouldn't do, you know. And and then of course the son who sent, well, he's alluding to himself, right? So in a historical kind of literal factual meaning, you think, okay, this is a parable about Israel. It foretells Israel's fate because they've not been faithful to God. You don't have to be a believer to figure that out. A little bit of cultural background, some context, you can figure that out. And there's a place for that. But that reading is not a spiritual reading. 
I want us to read it in a spiritual sense. And the first sense is the meditation sense. And what we ask is, how does this speak to, to us and our relationship with Christ? That's the first reading. The second reading is, how does this move me to action? This is the work of the Spirit. And the first move to action is prayer. That's why it's prayer in Latin. The second reading is the prayerful reading. But it's the one connected to the Spirit, the movement of the Spirit. And I'm, if I'm, as I'm moved by this text, I'm, the first thing I'm moved to do is pray. And then, of course, to act further beyond my prayer. And then the third way, the contemplation, is how do I see the love of the Father in this text? Those are the three spiritual readings. And I think this text can be a little challenging because if we stick with just the kind of the literal factual story he told and who he told it to, we're going to have real trouble reading it in a spiritual sense in, in any of these three senses because we'll just keep thinking, okay, but he's telling the scribes and Pharisees they ruined Israel by not accepting the words of the prophets and now not his word. We got to, we got to say, yes, that's true, but we're now going to look at it in a different way. So, you can pick anything in here, but let's start with what are some ways we might read this? And you may have questions too. You're welcome to ask questions, or if I'm not, if my little uh, laying this out hasn't been clear, please ask questions. So, either if you've got some questions, or if you want to start taking a stab at how do we read this as relating to our own spiritual relationship with Christ. I think it ties to your, your sermon today. I mean, if we have not completely died to ourselves. So when the sermons come, I, I ignore them. I hope they don't kill them. And, and, you know, when Christ himself is there, it's like excuses. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and what, what might this... And in this reading, in this way of reading it spiritually as, as portraying my own relationship with Christ, who might the servant be who come from God? And then you can use, you're free to use your imagination. Because we're no longer tethered to the, to, to explicitly, well, what was Jesus saying and to whom was he speaking? So who might the servant be in that reading? I said to me, me, I help you all the time. <laughs> yeah, but that's a spouse, but certainly you yeah. today, even in your almost broken. So people, people in our lives can be those servants that God is sending to us. And yeah, so I can read in the sense of am I am I open to listening to the encouragement or the admonition or, or edification coming from brothers and sisters? Those are big fancy words, but how they're just how they're just helping me or speaking some word to me, right? So those could be the servants that God is sending, right? Okay. You mentioned about um, we only have uh, a level of trust because we see this what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so maybe when we don't trust God, I'm sort of doing this. He's thinking he's giving us opportunity to make it a little bit more intense each time. When we refuse to trust them. Yeah. Okay. And and I'm gonna that la that last that third way of reading where you you focus on the father's love. That could be the father's love. Because you can say this is kind of a harsh story, you know. People are getting you know criticized and then rejected because it. But where's the father's love? It's just what they would say. God unrelentingly keeps sending. Message. Because he loves me too much to just say, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sending Greg any more servants, right? In that sense. So so that can be you where you could you know the the idea is you kind of do it in order. At the end of your reflecting on this passage, you could think, and my am I love, because the father relentlessly sends servant after servant, even when I reject, he still loves me and he still tries to get me the message. See. You see what I'm saying? That's where you can see it in those terms, right? So yeah, that's another one. What other reading? 
Well, I, I was just thinking of what David said. In my past, God has sent numerous people into my life with mental problems. And at one point, I stopped and I asked God, I said, why do these people keep showing up in my life? And it has occurred to me. It was me. <laughs> now, it occurred to me that there were some issues that I had in my past. So I didn't know. Right. I didn't know. So I needed to. Yeah. So you kind of saw that in the mirror. Right, right. So their struggles were helping you realize you had those struggles, right? And again, that's a very loving thing for God to be doing, to, to be nurturing us to goodness in that kind of way, right? Okay, yeah? I don't know where this falls in, but I'm thinking God himself, um, kind of related to what Carolyn was saying, throughout many situations that we go through, uh, many struggles, Sometimes we don't know where God is, and we start to spiral maybe down a bad road. But God will, um, in his grace, strengthen us when we don't even ask him, you know, just through his mercy and his love and his grace. And we could be spiraling in one minute, and then the next minute we just find strength inside of us that can only come from him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I the many of the trials that I've had the last two or three years. First of all, God put those trials in my life, and then it's amazing to me that people that the kindest strangers, back to the doing part, just unexpected kindnesses. Yeah. All right. Good. We're doing good. We're thinking about this. Okay. But let, let me give another little suggestion. When we're thinking about it, often you can postulate, you can implicate yourself into it in a different role. Alan kind of got us started with what if I'm the 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 tenants and and I'm rejecting, you know, I, and it's easy to read. Because he directed it that way. He directed it to the scribes and Pharisees, to the religious leaders, and they were they were the ones who were the tenants of the vineyard. But what if we put ourselves not as the tenant, and there's valid ways to think about that spiritually. What if we put ourselves in some other place, role in this story? I think about what if I'm the vineyard? How do how does it speak to me if I'm the vineyard? Yeah. Since we're in this sort of break and we're thinking about what we're doing, yeah. can we just ask a favor and back up just a hair? Please. And go back to, okay, so human, and, and you like to go in order. Father, the church father likes to go in order. Human sense, and then one sense with the focus on the son, and then one with the focus on the spirit, and then one with the focus on the father. Yes. And they like to go in that order. Well, Nothing's written in stone, yeah. sure, right. <laughs> but generally, it's just like a formula. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were finding the process. Yeah, and you know, and, and there's a sense of the order because if you first read it and you try and imagine yourself as somehow implicated in the story, I'm I'm the tenant who's not doing a good job with what God has given me, and I'm, you know, or I'm the messengers who are sent. To others who kind of like the disciples having to go to towns and they don't receive their word, shake the dust off your feet. Sometimes you're in that position. You know, so you to think about it first in that meditation space of how does this speak to me about my full life in Christ? It has everything to do with me trying to live a spiritual life in Christ. Then it does make sense then to start asking, but how does this then move me? How am I urged? What am I? sensing of the spirit that's urging me it's a conviction often you know i feel more convicted to something that is the second and but the third is kind of that peaceful place of lest we get caught up in some new form of legalism that makes us harried and 
exasperated. The last one is always to sit back and rest in the Father's love and care. So that you're not, even if you feel urged to do something, it's never like I'm urged to do it, but you know, that's so I can win the father's love. You know, you always end with that I am love. Of course I'm that makes it so that is an order. But it's not obviously straight because I violated it and jumped right to the end. But <laughs> what Dave says is a good place to find that. Oh, but I'm loved. He keeps sending. Right. So what about the vineyard? How does it read if if and what if I didn't make it? Singular, but if it's not I'm the vineyard, but we're the vineyard. Right? Do we have yeah, so we have a great tendency to read everything individualistically? And I try to break that that good American Western habit to read everything individualistically. But that is so abstract that it would never occur to me to be the vineyard. But when you said that earlier, I started thinking about it. It's kind of like if we're the vineyard, it's you, you would sit there and look at all the chaos around you. And so in some ways you could say here in the U.S., an example I was trying to think of was just because it's on my mind, we're the vineyard here in America, and the chaos is what's going on in Israel right now. I really can't control it. I'm just in it. But I add that the chaos is also Christian nationalism. Yeah. Yeah, you could say there's all kinds of chaos. I mean, I just, and what's the vineyard doing? It's just so, trying to be a vineyard. Yeah. Right. Meanwhile, there's people trying to attend it and not doing a good job and trying to use it. Is anyone trying to use me, us, right? You know, and then there's conflicting, there's a there's the the tenants, but then there's the messengers and the vineyard. Yeah, you the vineyard's kind of caught in the middle of it all. Just trying to be a vineyard. That's because vineyard is or fig tree is often used as a metaphor for Israel itself. When Jesus curses the fig tree, that is not the reason he chose a fig tree, right? Because it, it represents Israel. It has represented Israel for generations. And same with a vineyard. You go to the Old Testament and you, one of the prophets, I don't remember who he says, you know, he brought his people out, he made this vineyard, he tended the vineyard, but the nations have trampled down, you know, the walls of the vineyard. But, you know, the vineyard is an ancient way of talking about Israel. So he's on, he's in familiar territory. So but what else? Yeah. How else can it speak to us if we read ourselves as the vineyard? I was thinking of God's, the Jewish people. And the before before the Second World War, they were very profitable. <clears throat> God's people. Um, fascism comes in and starts changing the category, changing the culture, changing the way we think about others. And they overtook God's people, plundered them, they took all the fruits of their neighbors, they stole it. That's how I was reading it. Okay. As a vineyard. Okay. No. What about the idea of when I see myself as a vineyard, I see God caring about the vineyard and caring about the misuse of the vineyard. And so if I put myself in, if I think about my relationship in Christ and and, and it's often good to do these various things, plug yourself in at different points in the story, right? I plug myself in it, the vineyard. The first thing I think about is he wants to protect and take care of me. He wants the best for me. And there's those who don't, but he's caring. Right? And he's trying to keep at bay those who would misuse or mislead. So I find a kind of comfort in that. In that if I'm the vineyard, God wants to protect and take care of his, his children. Just another way to read. Okay, how do we? How, how can we read it in this meditative space? Church. You could read it as the church. Yeah. And you could read church leaders as describing Pharisees, <laughs> <laughs> who often are not doing well with the flock. 
which is a story that has continued. <laughs> Too often, that's also the story. Not really changed much from Israel. If its leaders didn't do well, the church is often in a situation where its leaders aren't doing any better than the scribes and Pharisees are doing. Right? So, taking your vineyard thing along, the vineyard needs to tend it. It just can't on its own. Well, I guess it could, but mostly you'll have weeds and yeah. the grapes wouldn't grow. But you, you need to, there needs to be some effort to mature it in a right way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so reading it that way could lead me to think about how God is telling me I need to be tender. Again, away from that individualism, like I could do this on my own. No, you can't. You need to be tender, right? And God sends back to God sends people to help you be receptive. This is not a an individualistic project of your own spiritual maturity. It's impossible. It has to be. In oh, I like that reading. Yeah, right. How kind of the relationality of our own spiritual growth could be represented in the story. Okay, so what if we move to the to the second reading, the second spiritual reading, the one founded more on the Holy Spirit, and and urge to some in some way move. And, and that move is just a very metaphorical move, okay? It could be a move of attitude. It could be a move in life, a, a, a call to something. What, what might we hear out of this passage? And again, it could be very, very different. And it could be different in people. This is, these spiritual readings, there is not a right reading. When we're reading it spiritually, when you're reading it in the human sense, there is a right reading. Jesus told a parable at a certain time to certain people, and he meant a certain thing, right? But once you go to the spiritual readings, then you don't think, well, did I get that right? <laughs> Everyone can read it differently, and it all can be right. Does that make sense? We have to get away from this idea that it has a single meaning. It speaks to us in various ways. So what are some of the readings that we might read in this in this? Matter of the Holy Spirit urging us to prayer and action. Yes, Mike. The bold thought I've been thinking of this whole time is what I've always understood that passage to be is that the religious leaders all throughout, um, and God's been leading them, they've been doing the wrong thing. And like in Matthew 23, he really nails them, um, the leaders and saying, You killed. Of prophets, which I believe were the servants in your passage. Um, he sent the servants first, and then he sent his son. Oh, oh, believe in my son. They killed them all. And Jesus called them in Matthew 23 for um, having been responsible for all the blood that was shed, basically. So it's kind of tainted on this way, I guess. Even though you think you're religious leaders, we all should. And they thought they were right and you're doing wrong the whole time. I like what you've been teaching when I've been in your class that we all need to be deconstructing and reconstructing what we believe so we don't just believe that we've always believed and think we're right. And that's just some thoughts that popped into my head. Okay. Yeah. So there could be, yeah, how did the pastors thinking about it? In terms, like you said, in terms of our relationship with Christ, there's a there's a need to to be humble about. Well, I talk about this way, hold lightly what we believe. We believe certain things and we hold them, but we hold them lightly, lest we be holding them so tightly that when God wants to change something, I'm sorry, God, I'm not changing that. You know, I've got to hold it so lightly that I'm open to God shining more light. So yeah, so the prayer that could be coming out of that is help me to always be humble, ready to listen, and not to be so dogmatic or, or fixed in my thinking that when you send a messenger, I'm not listening, right? I don't listen. So yeah, that could be the prayer, a feeling of kind of urging towards humility right? about what we know or think we know. <laughs> we'll go back. I, I can't get past the, uh, where the vineyard, uh -huh. you know, what, if, what does the vineyard produce? The fruits of the spirit. Okay. Right. And I've met people 
from all different religions, all different walks of life that exhibit fruits of the spirit. So there's many ways to tend the vineyard mm -hmm. to produce the fruits of the spirit. And to think that we're the only ones that the the way we do it is the only way. It's lots of hubris. Okay. So what what prayer might come out of that? Like an urging, maybe an urging to to be more looking for where God is at work. If if I'm feel somewhat convicted in that way, because this has to do with conviction. Like I kind of feel an urging, like oh, that's something I need to work on or something I need to emphasize. And if that's the thing I feel like I need to emphasize, I've got to remember that yeah, God's God's vineyard is God's vineyard, and it may be bigger and it may include people I hadn't thought of. So I could I could read it that way, and then the prayer I have would be like, Lord, help me to not be in my own mind too limited about what you're doing in the vineyard you're tending, right? I mean, that could be the prayer that comes out of it. Of course, and then I'm trying to live into those attitudes, live out that prayer. Right? It always starts with prayer, or it should, right? It's not a perfunctory prayer to somehow get something done. It's like it, that's our first way of connecting with what God's doing is to put it into some sort of prayer and then try and let that bear more fruit. Yeah, fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Um, Maybe to think about only drinking wine from grapes that are grown responsibly. <laughs> I was thinking maybe to pray about like the things that God allows me to participate in. They want either credit for it or want to change it to what I think it should be or make things more efficient or just, you know, participate in you know, the way I'm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So a, a prayer, a kind of moving of that we feel that a person can feel convicted about of coming out of these passages. What else? Any other prayer? Look for the good. Yeah. Any other prayers? When you're talking about acting, I, and then you go back to prayer, I just, I mean, praying to be willing to be willing. Yeah. Willing to be willing. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a good prayer. Help me be willing to be willing. Okay. I want to want to. But I know I sometimes don't. Help me to want to. Yeah, to want to want to. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even saying I want to yet. I just want to want to. I'd like to be able to be, be really wants to. But I know I know. Yeah. 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 I want you to see the dynamic because we've been talking about these these contemplative practices lead to discernment. Right? It leads to discernment. What we're talking about is when we when we slow down and push away the business of life and engage in either contemplative prayer or this contemplative reading of scripture, which is really just praying scripture, and we're, we're meditating on these things, we're trying to listen to God. That's what we're doing. We're listening to God speaking to us. It is out of the out of that kind of practice that then we start to get an a sense of maybe what God is actually doing, and we start to discern that, and we know where to engage. Right? So we really have to discernment to, to work differently. You know, you know, red light, green light, you know, give me, I'll, I'll lay out three options on the table, Lord, and you make the light shine on the one option I'm supposed to take. <laughs> discernment on the right one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want the discernment to work that way. It doesn't. But this kind of a term thinking and attitude that we're talking about that can be cultivated in what we're talking about will lead to a person who's not wrapped up in the immediacy of the clamor of the world and the urgency of deadlines. It's going to be a person who's 
regularly stepping back from all of that and thinking about, well, what's God doing? That person will be able to discern we, amidst all the clamor and chaos of the world and all the up. This is where the still voice of God is leading to know what those things are, right? So that's where the, there's a real there's a real fruitfulness in our own lives, cultivating peace, cultivating joy, cultivating the fruit of the spirit, taking time to slow down and do these sorts of things, right? But they're all they see, they're listening practically. They're trying to read this and listen. It's the idea that scripture. We don't read scripture. Scripture reads us. Have you ever heard that? It really reads us. Because when I get beyond the kind of the historical factual reading, what I see in it is really an is really a mirror of my own psyche at the moment. Right? That's sometimes embarrassing. Like, oh, I hate the fact that that is revealing what is actually going on in my subconscious. But it is. Right? When I read the passage and ask these kinds of questions, it starts pointing out to me what's going on. If I'm in turmoil, I see turmoil. It, like, I'm longing for lack of turmoil. Well, maybe that's an indication that I'm in the midst of turmoil. You know, it starts to read me more than I'm reading it. Okay, there you have it. Well, I just, uh, I guess I am thinking that uh, kind of all of these things are useful. Uh, so it's hard to articulate, you know, what is the thing, because it seems like the, uh, for me, maybe the, the biggest uh, thing I'm thinking right now is that it's a little bit of all these things, right? I'm a vineyard. And I'm connected to life through the vine, and, and, and I'm cared for, and my fruits matter, and they are misused, and that is wrong. And, but I'm, a, I'm the tenant. Yeah. And I think that connects to uh, the parable before it, too, where Jesus talked about tax collectors and prostitutes getting it sooner than than the um than others the, the scribes and pharisees i guess and and that i am that group that's slow to get and so i need to be aware of that but also i see sometimes you know it's a little easier maybe for me to see where other people where the church it's always eager to see where, <laughs> other people come in, right? where they where they're abusing christ you know, and, and not, and, and uh, rejecting the, the real message. And, and then what is the, what's the actionable thing for that? I guess to call attention to it or to not cover it or, or to move on. And then also the, I think putting those two parables together because in the one before it, which I think they're connected, they, mm -hmm. he doesn't say they don't get to the kingdom of heaven. That's right. He says, that other people get the tax collectors and prostitutes get there first. They're entering in before you. So yeah. I wonder if the, the the cornerstone crushing and scattering dust is a little bit of a metaphor that you you haven't died yet, and that you need to go through a dying process before you get there. And and so this barrier, what can it can feel like it's a wall, but it's really the process of you getting prepared to to join. Yeah. You know the good, the good kingdom uh, movement. Yeah, I, I think I like that way of thinking about it. I like to think about it that way, but it's not the way I was raised to think about these. And I'll just jump to another one where Jesus says, you know, those who come and say, "Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not cast out demons? Do it?" And He says, "Away with you!" And of course, we always read, "Away with you eternally, never to darken my door again." But rejected forever. Of course, let's say that. My, my my reading now is away with you. Come back when you have a better thing to say. Right? It's not like don't ever come back, but right now is what you're saying. Just just leave. Right? Is he willing to welcome them back? Yes. When they don't come, Lord, Lord, look at what I've done. When they come back, Lord, 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 tell me what I should have done. Then he would have welcomed. Right? So it's that same sort of sense as. Yeah, the scribes and Pharisees, he's not saying you won't enter in. He's just saying you're not at the front of the line. You think you are, but you're the slow to learn, right? So I I agree. I think I think that reading is important. I don't think Jesus is telling any of us, you're, you're too slow up. But oftentimes part of that crushing process is the thing you have to hear is 
you're not even close. Go away and think about it a while and come back later when you've got a, a better idea about what you think I want to hear. Right? That's that long, to me, it's long suffering that God is like, you go away. Try again. Because this ain't working. You were going to say something like this. Well, I just, I, I guess uh, because all of those things, I guess I need to know. I need to think about all of those things. Yeah. And I just think it's interesting that um, that's a little easier to do in a group and hear other people's ideas and thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. It, I agree. It's easier to do in a group. And the more we do it in groups, the easier it becomes to do it when we're not in a group. Because you, you, st you start being affected by so and so always bringing up this viewpoint, you know, and then all of a sudden that you start hearing their voice even when they're not present. You remember, yeah, but they would say this, and they would make me think about it that way, right? So I agree. I think it's well, it, it's it's good for us. It's it's a good practice for us to do some of this together to get in the habits of it, and then we can do it. And we're not just kind of like writer's block, you know, <laughs> getting the passage again. I'm getting back, you know. You've always said Christian, like Christian. Which, what's your name? <laughs> um, you've always said you can't be a Christian as a, yeah, yeah. if you were like the only Hello. Christian and I. Right. So, I mean, that makes sense yeah. to me the way. Yeah. It's a relation, it is. It's a relational reading of scripture. Even if I'm doing it by myself, I'm reading it relationally with others, right? And the light comes on. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the balance. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So since we're doing this in community, my comment as part of the community would be a little caution around a lot of the symbols and and of course there's a meditative component and you need to sort of listen to what the spirit is saying. But there's a long standing history, particularly with the church fathers, of saying like, oh, the enemy Finding the weeds in this particular parable is certainly this individual. It's this pope. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, this person is the pearl of great price, or I'm the the vine, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a lot that can go wrong in uh, in anatomizing those uh, symbols. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I was literally taught in undergraduate when I'm starting off my theological studies, I was taught to never read scripture this way. It was too fraught with danger. And I was actually told that you're going to see the apostles reading the Old Testament this way, but you don't do it. And at the time, it didn't register with me. What? Because the thing was, well, they're inspired. They can do funny things with the text. I mean, you, you can't. You stick to the what it, it's literal meaning, right? So John David's got a great point, especially if I read it in a kind of self-righteous way. I can identify the enemies as others. If I'm reading it and someone else was mentioning that, oh, I guess Derek was mentioning, it's so easy to read it about others and not about myself. That's not what the sacred reading of scripture is. It's not reading it about others with others in view. The meditative reading is how does this speak to me and my relationship with Christ? It doesn't, it's not about how it speaks to someone else's relationship, which I can find that all day long, right? But that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. That's me going and looking at the speck in someone else's eye rather than meditating on what is the log in my own eye, right? So if we limit ourselves to how does this speak to me, and what does it urge me to do? Because I can all day long find problems with others and what they ought to be doing. And then my prayer becomes, Lord, help them to do right. Which means I've learned nothing. Right? So, so John David is right. There's a history of identifying yeah, individuals with certain you know, symbols. And then you know, the beast in Revelation is being identified as anyone you didn't like. <laughs> well, uh, and that's not the sacred reading of scripture as laid out by the fathers. The question, if I was reading about the beast in Revelation, the question would be, how can I be that beast? Or how can that beast be getting me? 
not about anyone else. It's about my relationship. Right? So you, you mentioned uh, and that, but to the point is that keeps us out of the danger of, of using these texts in in kind of uh, violent ways. Really, you be the amounts to violence, you know, kind of weaponizing the text against others. That's never a good reading of the text. Right? It always should convict me. It's not about convicting anyone else. Yes, that's the only question is, have I been rejecting the messages? Have I been killing Christ? Or, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not who else might be have been doing that. No. Okay. Uh, the, you, you mentioned uh, hearing the voice of others around you. So today, during the uh, prayers of the people, I heard Edwina say, immigrant to revenue. <laughs> Whether she's here or not, you should see it. That's a good thing. It's interesting. It brings to mind what she's with, you know, with the children she has that made her very aware with a Guatemalan dog, you know, what are we, you know, how are these people faring it? You know, yeah. So I'm not the only one. Right. You <laughs> hear her voice, right? It's just like, for those who you know, a long time, you remember Homer Dog, it's all about love. We have to hear Homer telling us all right, it's all about work. Well, you know, okay. You know, we hear his voice even though he passed on years ago. Right? That's where we're no longer reading it except in community. It's always, the, and you ought to be hearing Paul, and you ought to be hearing Peter, and you ought to be hearing Jesus. You are never, even if I'm by myself reading, I'm not reading it alone. And again, that's part of the safeguards historically that John Day was talking about that keeps me going off on a tangent and then you know, justifying myself or something. I have to read it in community with all these other saints and believers. And what were they about? You know, and that constrains it. Okay. So last thing, real quick, what are some things about the the, the last part is some of the most difficult is the contemplative. Yeah. Where you just think about the father's love. The reason it's the most difficult, well, in some passages, it's particularly difficult. You're like, there's nothing in this passage about love. You really have to search hard to think, how does this speak about love? The other thing that people talk about, and I'll say this real quick, but we started late. So there's a sense in which sometimes in that contemplative space, we feel a, a kind of spiritual elation. You just feel this coming over you of joy or a sense that you are loved. You are deeply, irrevocably loved. There's nothing you know, that, that comes upon you, and you're kind of gripped by it. And what the, um, the church fathers, the ancient people say is, it's a gift. When it comes, receive it as such, but don't hang on to it. Let it pass. In other words, you... You're, you are not to become, you know, a person who like, if, if I don't get that gift, I'm unhappy. No, that gift comes when God gives it. And it'll come, and then it may pass, and then you're just thankful that you had that moment of feeling, you know, kind of wholeness. Like, I feel at one with the world, and the sunlight's beautiful, and you kind of feel this elevated sense of connection. When it comes, be thankful, but don't try and hold on to it. because we don't live in that space. We've been grown in that space. Yeah, exactly. We've been grown with balance. Yeah. Right. It, it's for its own purpose, but you are not to become like, you know, always chasing after that because you can't manufacture it. I don't know the difference between that and human infatuation. Um, it might be the subject of it or it might be the contour. I would think the contours of it. Like, if it's going to be of God, if it is about wholeness, if it is about relationality, if it is about love, if it is about a fruit of the spirit, then it's not simply infatuation. And, and a lot of things that are human infatuation are actually lesser attempts at those greater contemplative ecstasies of the, of the elevated state of, of experiencing that. And if so, so I wouldn't, I, I think some of our longings are longing for that. But, but the counsel is always, it may only come occasionally. You don't, you don't spend the time looking for that. And you don't say, well, it didn't work because I felt no elevated sense of the presence of God. 
That's not why you do it. It's a gift that's given sometimes. You're, you know, you just all of a sudden, you're reading the passage and you feel overwhelmed. You flow through, just like it's something bad. Ooh, yes. Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't hang on to that either. You let that go. Yeah. So, the, yeah, and that's the point they're making. So it doesn't always happen, but the, but the idea is at the last, and you might only do this for 10 minutes, right? You don't have to spend an hour. If you kind of ran through this in 10 minutes, the last thing to think about is to think about that I'm loved by the Father. From this passage, you could say, and I'm the vineyard and he cares so deeply about me. He wants to keep away those who try to misuse me. You know, and and damage me spiritually or whatever. Take advantage. He's trying to protect protect me from them. How do I envision the love here, or loving enough to keep sending time after time, despite my stubbornness? Right? How do I? That may move me to an overwhelming sense of that love, or I may just think about it and remember it. But either way, we're not judging the success of it. This is not a a thing where you say, well. It, didn't work this time because <laughs> I didn't feel that. Right. All right, we'll stop there. Um, thanks. Thanks for examples and participation.